Now there's this guy back in the 1970s named Rudolf Virchow. And if you think about it, in the, I'm sorry, it's the 1970s, please. How about the 1700s? Uh, who came up with the reason why people get blood clots in veins. And he came out with three components. Part of this you already heard about earlier today. Slow blood flow. Vein blood flow is not as fast as artery blood flow. So the blood kind of it takes its time getting out of the veins. Some sort of damage to the inner lining of the vein, irritation injury, that can be from a fracture. It can be from a cast. It can be from a prior blood clot or a burn. Any of that stuff can be the second component. And then the third one is thick blood. You heard a great deal about the proteins in the blood that make your blood thick, but there are other things that can do it, like pregnancy that thicken the blood. You take these three things, you put them together, the risk of getting a blood clot goes up. So how do we prevent blood clots? Well, you're, again, I would stick with what you just heard. I don't have to spend any time on this. We divide patients' risk into low, moderate, high, and very high risk, all due to the factors that Dr. Ansel mentioned. Age, body weight, underlying health, activity level. Those kinds of things increase the risk. And when you add up risk factors, the risk goes up. So for example, if you're having a uh, hip fracture replacement in a, an 85-year-old person who fell and broke a hip, who also, by the way, is being treated for cancer, you start adding up these risks, that, that person's a setup for a vein blood clot. But if you take a 35 or a 40-year-old person who needs to have their gallbladder taken out and it's done through a scope and they go home either later that day or the next morning and they have no other medical history, well, that person's risk is significantly lower. It doesn't mean they can't get one, but the odds are much lower than the person who had surgery for a hip fracture while they're 85 and being treated for cancer. And of course, also as you heard, you always weigh the risk of clotting to the risk of bleeding. Just like Dr. Ansel said, if the risk of bleeding is really high, someone's got a history of an active ulcer in the stomach and actually bled from that ulcer, and now they're going to go and have um, uh, a bunion repaired, we're going to be preventing that blood clot in a much different way than we would in someone who's never had a bleeding event um, has had a previous blood clot five years ago and is now going to get on a plane to go to Australia, right? It's all weighing the risks of clotting to the risks of bleeding. It is not always clear. It, there's not always a right and wrong. The flip of the coin is actually often how the discussion goes. Many times you'll say to me, well, what would you do if it were you, doc, or your wife or your mother? And the first thing I'll say is, well, you presume I love my mother, right? Because, you know, if it's, uh, yeah. but um, it's not always black and white. And it really does require that discussion of risks of bleeding or clotting with the patient and the doctor. One thing that we like to do is do things that cause no harm, that offer potential benefit, right? If it doesn't cause any harm and can offer help, why not give it a try? So if you're going to have an operation, and I'm worried about bleeding, and I want to lower your risk of blood clots, I can use something like this. This is a thing that wraps around your leg. How many of you have been in the hospital and have had surgery and you had one of these things on your calf that, yeah, right? I mean, it's not a miserable thing. It's a little inconvenient, but in the scope of things, it's a lot worse than getting, a, a lot better than getting a blood clot. What this thing does is it rhythmically compresses and releases and it forces that vein blood out of your leg. Makes the blood flow faster and more repeatedly. And so it lowers the incidence of blood clots. And in some situations, this is all we have to do. In others, this is one component of what we do. But the nice thing about this is, it really doesn't increase your risk of anything. And yet it could lower your risk of a blood clot. So there are lots of recommendations out there, lots of scores. Again, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you can see here that we increase what we do based on what our view is your risk of having a clot is. So if we think your risk is extraordinarily low, extraordinarily low, we might tell you that don't do anything specific except get out of bed quickly. 
So that person who gets the laparoscopic gallbladder removal, we just tell them, get up and out of bed quickly, period. That's all you need to do. But in someone who's had a hip fracture and is older and is not mobile and has cancer, we're going to really think about using one of those compression pumps, putting on a compression stocking, and giving shots of some medication or a pill blood thinner. So you see what I mean? You take the number of risks, you add them up, and as the risk goes up, you jack up what you use to prevent blood clots. Now, that's the prevention part. If you are not lucky enough to have prevented it, and now you have one, what do we do? So there are a whole bunch of guidelines out there. When I was in training, this was all we did. IV heparin. Come into the hospital, they put an IV in the vein in your arm, and they put this bag of heparin, and it runs through you 24 hours a day. And every six hours, you get a blood test, and it tells us whether the heparin's at the right dose. In other words, is your blood thinned appropriately, but not too thin that you could bleed? This is still widely accepted as a very effective way to treat blood clots. And remember, our goal for treating the blood clot you have is to make sure you don't get another blood clot. That's the goal. In the short term, that's a high, high risk situation. If you have a blood clot in the middle of your thigh, in a deep vein in the middle of your thigh, and you don't do anything about it, there's a 50-50 chance, not a one in a thousand chance, a one in two chance that that blood clot's gonna travel up your leg, break off, and go to the heart and the lungs. So we gotta do something right away. This is one way to do it. It's really not convenient, right? I mean, first of all, who wants to be in a hospital for five to seven days tethered to an IV? It's not, but this works. What you're probably more used to are these types of shots of medicines called low molecular weight heparins. Just an example of advances of medical science. It's the same type of treatment, but now you don't have to be tied to an IV, and you don't have to be laying in a hospital bed. Those are all good. So you take shots of this medication, and it thins your blood, and it works. And many times we use these shots in different doses for people who are getting on planes going to Australia. So it's not infrequent that I'll say to my high-risk patients, I want you to take a shot of this in the restroom an hour before you get on the plane. So these medications work, and they're far more convenient. Now there's another one, also by injection, that works a different way. So the mechanism whereby it prevents blood clots from getting worse is different, but it does the same, it accomplishes the same goal. It lowers the risk of new blood clots from forming. It's called Fonda Paranux or Erixtra. And the nice thing about this one is that it's got a longer half-life. It means it stays around longer. So you only have to use it once a day as compared to twice a day. Um, that could be a downside, too. If you have a really long half-life and you start bleeding, you've got to worry about its effects longer. So again, these are kind of the risk of clotting versus risk of bleeding story that you keep hearing me talk about. And then, of course, good old Coumadin. We already heard the questions about what other side effects can occur with Coumadin. I can tell you I've never been in Coumadin, and uh, you can see a little bit of hair loss there. Um, here's the issue with Coumadin. Word to the wise. It does take five days for Coumadin to actually prevent new blood clots from forming. So during those five days, you're not protected if you have a new blood clot. You can't just start Coumadin alone if you have a new blood clot. That's why your doctor uses a shot of one of those other medications while you're taking Coumadin, just to get you started, right? And once the blood test shows that the Coumadin's where it needs to be, it's at the right dose, that INR test, that says that it's right where it needs to be, that's when you can stop the shots. Usually you gotta overlap them for four or five days, and that's an important word to the wise. So if you, uh, or someone you love, is diagnosed with a new vein blood clot in a leg or the lung, and someone says, just take this prescription for Coumadin, you know it's time to ring that wait a minute whistle, because uh, that's not necessarily right. 